Hi, I'm Carl Azus, and welcome to Fridays Are Awesome. Not exactly the name of our show, but it's still facts. And as our spring season winds down with one more week on the air, we're happy to have you watching. We are a week and a half away from the official start of the Atlantic hurricane season, though we've already seen an early storm materialize off the U.S. East Coast. Arthur brought gusty winds and rain to parts of North Carolina before heading out to sea. The U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration just released its 2020 hurricane forecast, and it predicts there could be an active season ahead with 13 to 19 named storms and 6 to 10 hurricanes. An average season sees 12 named storms and 6 hurricanes. Not all of the big systems make landfall, and just like with the weather, not all of the forecasts pan out, though NOAA says its predictions are accurate 70% of the time. On the other side of the Northern Hemisphere, a large storm did make landfall this week. Coastal communities of northeastern India and Bangladesh are assessing the damage from Cyclone Ampan. At one point, it was the most powerful storm ever recorded in the Bay of Bengal. It was the equivalent of a Category 5 hurricane, but by the time Ampan made landfall on Wednesday, it had weakened to Category 2 status with sustained wind speeds of 105 miles per hour. Still, its storm surge brought flooding to coastal areas, and water and debris have made it difficult for rescuers to get to survivors. The cyclone killed at least 80 people and destroyed the homes of thousands more. And even though an estimated 3 million were evacuated in India and Bangladesh before the storm arrived, that in itself brought an additional challenge of keeping them separated in shelters because of the threat of coronavirus. Globally, health officials say more than 5 million people have now tested positive for the disease, and while most of them have or will recover, more than 300,000 deaths have been blamed on COVID-19 throughout the world. No one knows how long its impact will last. We don't know when we'll be able to return to our studio. And when people do return to offices, they'll see a very different looking workplace. Over the past few decades, they've evolved to this. Open plan social hubs like the Salesforce Tower in San Francisco. We love to come together. We love to collaborate. We love to have face-to-face -face meetings, and we loved it when the offices were crowded. Salesforce has spent the last eight weeks turning those principles on their head. Inspired by this model from real estate firm Cushman & Wakefield, dubbed the Six Feet Office, it's not exactly a return to cubicles, but there are eerie similarities. There may be plexiglass dividers between workstations on the open floor plans, and then even meeting rooms will have big capacity signs because they are not able to hold as many people as before. It's really about giving people visual cues to help remember about that physical distancing. Plans are still being finalized, but masks will be mandatory, shifts will be staggered, temperatures checked, elevators in the company's many towers socially distanced. Across the corporate world, high-rise offices present a particular challenge. We're changing technology to uh, be able to uh, use Bluetooth to go touchless into the elevators. Scott Reckler runs RXR Realty, the fourth largest office landlord in Manhattan. He is reevaluating every detail of his buildings. All the HVAC um, systems have been changed so that they have uh, filters that are the highest grade filters that pull up, pull up, pick up the smallest particles. Where possible, we're changing um, locations like for pantries and, and printers that usually are in corners where get congested to more open spaces. And technology also critical to his plan. They'll have an app that before they even come to work, they'll be able to actually look to see what the health index of the building is. When you go into your space, there's going to be a tool on your app that actually will monitor your extreme social distancing. And at the end of the day, you'll be able to uh, see that I was at 70%, 75%. Amidst all that change, there's one part of this new office reality that's already here. And that's working from home. Many companies are planning to stagger shifts. Others are telling staff who can work from home that they can keep going. Twitter has even told its employees that if they want to, they can work from home forever. It's clear in this world where the virus is still a threat. The ultimate trick to keeping offices safe is having fewer people in them. Claire Sebastian, CNN, New York. 10 second trivia. Which of these words is thought to have come from an old English term meaning to confuse, befuddle, exam, maze, or merge? Etymologists believe that a term meaning to confuse or astonish is the origin of the word maze.
And whether you find them dazing, amazing, amusing, or confusing, or some combo of all four, a British maze maker has been amazing people for years creating life-size labyrinths for folks in 40 countries. Some cost as little as $130, some cost as much as $1.3 million. But one thing Adrian Fisher is really good at is finding the balance between making them challenging and making them fun. Mazes are one of the most fascinating things. Almost everybody, as soon as they can crawl, are always wanting to find out what's hidden, what's out of sight. My name's Adrian Fisher. I live in Dorset in England, and I create mazes and labyrinths all over the world. Well, I spent the first few years of my career in accountancy. There came a moment when I'd created a maze in my father's garden, and then I started building one and two more and so on. And then I suddenly realized this was going to be far more fulfilling if I spent my life creating mazes. This is the site of the place. This is 40 meters in diameter, and the maze is going here. Over the years, I've created mazes in some 40 countries, and I guess I've built over 700 full-size mazes in the landscape. I think a maze design is a very esoteric art. You sketch out ideas and develop ideas on paper and drawings. But well, one of the exciting things is a maze is a network. Now, a maze is a special kind of network where I decide there's only one start point, I decide where the finish is, and I make sure that every single bit of it can be as confusing or as easy as I wish. I'm trying to make it as ingenious and tricky as possible. But in the end, I'm also an entertainer. I like to leave clues that help you solve it and you feel so good about yourselves when you have beaten the maze designer. Like a good movie, you get to the end and you still, you don't want it to stop. I'm appealing to some basic instinct in us all that want to be entertained and explore. And a maze is an ideal way of doing that. Its purpose is totally at, to one side of normal, sensible, practical things in life, but gives so much pleasure to so many millions. Who needs Dominic the donkey when you've got Baldumera? Some of you have no idea what any of this means, but this is Baldumera. He lives in Spain, and his owner had to spend the last two months in quarantine, so he left his beloved pet donkey with his brother 20 miles away. The owner was afraid Baldumera wouldn't recognize him when he finally came back, but turns out there was nothing to fear. Was it Baldo Miraculous? Not exactly, but it is a brazing, or would you call it a mulesing, that the beast bravely bore the burden of missing his master when the owner's brother burrowed him. Donkey puns. They're he awesome, And so are the students of Lompoc High School. Let's go Braves in Lompoc, California. We will be off the air Monday for the Memorial Day holiday, but we will see you Tuesday as we kick off our last week of the season. I'm Carl Azus for CNN.